the user interface is a very Windows oriented user interface, which uh, most people are familiar with, if you are obviously familiar with Windows, with a series of ribbons, which have some contextual based controls involved in them. There is also a drop down menu in the left hand side with a few additional um, controls um, and we will see how some of those are used a little bit further on in the program. Charting wise, we talk about CMAP charts and the CMAP 4D charts. I, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of 4D because you can go online with Expedition and purchase the charts from within the program. Um, you go into your, in within CMAP charts, um, you have the ability to go and create an account within CMAP and purchase charts. As you can see here, I own a few charts. Some of them are still living in the cloud and some of them are living on my device. And one of the big advantages with CMAP 4D is you can have them installed up to your charts, um, installed in up to three devices, I believe, which I find to be a um, big advantage if you're running two machines or you know, a, a, have a spare redundant machine or for example, an on deck uh, handheld uh, computer. And it is very straightforward with an expedition to go into the, the 4D um, manager to, to select new charts to purchase and manage your account, etc. My charts are a little out of date, so we'll get some ding-a-lings as we go along and just to say, let me know that they're out of date. We do have, expedition can also use freely available electronic uh, navigation charts and raster navigation charts. Primarily, this is of use to to American users because um, the, the NOAA charts are freely available to download online and they are, you know, when I'm racing in the US, they are the charts that I will use. I have, excuse the errors, these are my out of date charts on this machine. So I'm just gonna take us up to a relatively familiar region for me, hopefully for most of you as well. Another nice benefit of the um, CMAP charts, the 4D, is that you get the raster baseline charts um that come bundled within the package so you can toggle on the actual um, raster charts which is the source data for um the uh the vector charts um that cmap use so as a navigator i you know like to research an area as much as possible especially if i'm racing in a new area and i find the raster charts very very useful we also have, well, for ENC charts, there are a bunch of controls for toggling on and off certain amounts of data to clean your screen up. You can do the same within CMAP, oh, cancel, sorry, by within CMAP settings, you can turn off and off, on and off, all sorts of data, some you may find useful, some you may not find useful. Now, it's very good, very important for me to point out now, which, some people takes a little while to realize is that the setting, wherever you see the settings button within Expedition, it is a little bit contextual in that depending on which ribbon you are in that has settings, it will default you to the relevant settings that for that ribbon that you are in. However, all of the settings for all of the controls in Expedition are held within the same dialogue. So if you want to start to look at settings for our track or for, for any of our data and numbers and things, it will, take you to the same dialogue but just into a a, a different uh, window if you like there are some controls standard controls for managing digital charts which i'm sure everybody will be relatively familiar with whether we want to just drag our chart around or follow our boat and but there are a few other controls for how you want to zoom the screen now these are interesting to play with i'll use one or two myself that you can, for example, zoom between the active mark and the boat as it's racing down the chart. So there's a number of different controls of how you can set up your screen personally. Uh, well, moving on from the charting and to move into controlling and using marks expedition, there's a number of different ways of controlling your marks for your race courses within the marks dialogue here obviously a very important button on the left that um, hopefully most of us will never have to use. Um, clicking the man overboard can fire off a few different protocols within Expedition. Within the marks ribbon, we do have the ability to open a folder which holds all of our marks in folders, which are all very customizable in terms of giving them names. You can give them certain attributes of whether or not they're locked in position or whether they will always be shown on the screen or they will only be shown when they are part of a route. 
And on the left hand side, we have some route management and we can move waypoints backwards and forwards from route folders, etc. We have the ability to, we have set up a race course to view the details, the lat long of each mark, range and variant between marks, etc. I won't talk too much about this because it's very much a, a standard part of any um, reasonable navigation package. But I will say though, is that the expedition has a quite nice ability to manage marks quite well just by using your mouse button on the screen. And for example, if I right mouse click somewhere on the screen here, I'm able to instantly set an active mark and route. So mark number 149 has been set up here. I can pick it up and drag it round. I can actually go in and edit that mark, edit its attributes, um, give it a sense of leaving to port or starboard, which is quite important for both weather routing and for, you know, when you set up a race course to, 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 to make sure that you go the right way around a mark. You have also have the ability to build a course from one of those initial marks by simply coming along here and adding a new end mark, for example. So now I've created a route. I've got the ability to come in and insert a mark in the middle. I can move that around. I can quite easily remove that mark from set mark, or I can actually go and delete a mark at any at the end of every of any particular route. Now I can also manually, in such a way, add other marks which I have drawn on the screen to the route. So I have anvil up here, for example, I'm gonna right mouse click on that and I wanna add anvil either at the start of the, of the, the route, after the first mark in the route or at the end. I'll put it in the middle here and you can see it instantly creates a nice little route. Lots of people have very different techniques, how they like working with the, um, marks and, and routes. There's no, definitive right way or wrong way is just as long as something works for you. There is also a very quick way of creating a route within Expedition using a visual marks tool and I can give something a name of a test route and then it just gives me the ability to go and click on the screen and it automatically creates a route that I can play around with and a, and a escape, click on escape would end that. If I do make errors which is quite common um, and a lot of people do, a very useful little button is the undo button where it will undo the previous action, undo the previous action, or I can actually redo it if I accidentally move a mark that I did not intend to, or I added one, for example. And we have some controls for moving through the active marks. It's not very clear right now. I get, would guess from your screen that the active mark is actually highlighted with a little yellow dot. This becomes more clear when we have ley lines, etc., displayed on the screen. We also have some more controls for how to set some marks. If you want to ping a mark, if you're sailing up a course or you're going past the buoy and you want to create a mark at a buoy, I just can ping, at, ping that mark at a bow. I can ping by a laser, but not many people are carrying laser range finders around. You have some controls to move marks by range and bearing or from the previous mark. Another useful little tool we have in Inside Expedition is just the ability to set some dividers, clear dividers, yes. And there are some, and we have um, some import and export tools for different um, mark protocols. A lot of people are familiar with GPX, for example, a lot of marks are published in, within, uh, in a GPX file and you can import those directly into Expedition with most of the protocols. Inside the sail ribbon, this is a very useful ribbon for, for setting up for your yacht and as well as while you are out on the racetrack. I'll talk a little bit more about polars in a minute. But you know, we have a polar dialogue with a bunch of different polar options and we can talk through those um, in a short while. And very same for sail chart. We have the ability to um, show a sail crossover chart and integrate it into Expedition. And this is used for um, both offshore weather routing and also for, for, for inshore work. Expedition creates a database when you first start it up and you have the ability to save specific events within Expedition for research later. Um, there's a very advanced part of Expedition running tests etc and analyzing tests and overlaying tests onto, onto polars. Um, we're not going to go into that now but the capability is there. One very useful part of events that I personally use is I will record any event which has happened during a day's racing and I will try to create this event as close as possible to the time of a sail change for example. So if we have a change, if we've hoisted up a J2, if I click on that there I can make an annotation and click OK and that event is saved into Expedition, into the Expedition database and this is that event right here. You'll notice that the 
has not given a position because right in this point in time, we don't have a GPS connected. Race tracking, very useful and very powerful tool for offshore sailing or short coastal racing where there is um, either yellow brick or blue water, for example, have, you know, you, they have a website where you can log in and access the position data. Yellow brick is a quick example and one of the more common ones. Each race will have its, um, its, its unique uh, name or handle and you have the ability to, when, once you have an internet connection, to effectively log in and download all that data. That also gives you the ability to then analyze your performance against any other boats which you have in the database, in a boat database, which would be populated once you've set up the download of those uh, other boats. You will also have the ability to view within this tracking dialogue, have a dialogue of, of all of the positions and, and speed over ground and course over ground averages between position reports for all of your other boats and they would be displayed on screen and an extension to that tracking is you will also have the ability to run each boat's optimal routing based on their previous position and a polar which you can you can you can identify for each boat. It's a very advanced feature, um, more commonly used, for example, in the in 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 you know in a Volvo race and a fleet of five boats. They've got a fairly good handle on each other's weak points and strong points with polars and they can optimize all of the other boats through the same weather that they're downloading to see how, you know, in theory where they are position wise, who is going to get to the finish first. A couple of other useful little tools. You can, um, instead of using the internal polar for your target wind angle and your target boat speed, you can actually ask the system to just use the true wind angle that I have now and the boat speed that I have now. Um, if for some reason you, there is a, an incredible amount of wind shear or your polar is away wrong, then you know the exhibition will just make your opposite tack ley line to match your current true wind angle and boat speed. Notes within sailing is a very powerful part of the package. It gives you the ability to record information graphically on a screen. For example, I can go and create a zone. Oh, that's not, I've turned the display of that off. Bear with me a second. I will turn those on. No, control S, just, so, just for purposes of demonstration here. Race notes, okay. So I can go and create a race note um, manually on the screen and these notes are very useful for a number of different reasons. One of them is you can use those zones to exclude or prevent expedition for doing any optimal routing through them. Um, but they're also very useful for areas um, where you may want to modify your charts or you have a different idea about um, a chart. So I have notes all over the place from where uh, different parts of the world where I've been sailing. Anything I find as a navigation hazard, I will freely um, let everybody know, but a lot of these are what you might consider um, inside knowledge, if you like. Moving along, we have a start ribbon. There's a bunch of, diff bunch of different functions within the start ribbon, um, being able to set your port and starboard ends of the start line. So if we're sailing along, we can ping our start line ends, and we have uh, methods of controlling them if we want to nudge them upwind or downwind if we think things have moved timer controls for our start time and some other controls for for in the pre-start part of sailing. For windward lured races is a very handy little utility to very quickly set up a uh, windward lured race. I It's not showing up because I don't have a um, start line so I'm just going to put a starboard star mark there and then it, it does become a no port start uh, windward lured, so I can actually go through and quickly create a windward lured course based on the information that's been given to you by the race committee. Moving along, weather is another big subject, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a wee while. Where we this is the the weather ribbon is to do with controlling the, your visualization of the weather and having a look at different weather models. Where the data is also a big subject with regards to. With, with regards to being able to download weather uh, grid files from a number of different sources, a number of different models, some, subscri some subscription based and some or a lot of them free. We also have the ability within Expedition, um, Nick has created a database uh, to download global observations into, onto your chart so you can actually see ships 
for example, and ship weather live. If I go into the National Data Boys Center and download, and now we have all of a sudden popped up on the screen labels from ships and um, data boys, weather boys, all around the you know, wherever the NOAA has their boys and their data that is of access. Now, if you there are a number of different sources of this data that you can um, access from within within Expedition um, Global Ships you download, and there will be a bunch more should pop up. Now these are uh, being dragged down off of a, uh, an online database and they, but they do not live update. So a very quick reload or refresh will bring up the latest data of any ships moving around. You can see some down in, in um, down off of um, Malta. Moving along again, optimal routing. This is another very large subject and this is where a lot of the control of your optimal routing is done from. I'm not going to touch on this now. This is a, this is a rather large subject, which um, we, which I'm going to address in a later in part of the series of seminars. Tools within Expedition, um, there's, this is sort of where things have ended up that, that don't really belong in any specific marks or weather area, for example. You, you do have the ability to clear your track that is being drawn on the screen by a boat, and you also have the ability to completely reload a track from your log file and redraw it on the screen if you want to go back for any particular reason and have a look at a log file. There are a couple of miscellaneous um, options through here. And again, I'm not going to go through these in too much detail. Playback, you do have the ability to go and open a log file and get it to re and run in Expedition. So it's almost like a, a live feed of your instrument system replaying a race. And what we do have as well, which I'm going to start now, is a, a uh, instrument simulator and um, I'm going to have um, the ground window put some noise in here and some polar boat speed. So um, it's going to go back into my charts dialogue and go follow boat. And as you can see, I've got a boat charging around in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. I'm going to create a mark nearby, um, set active mark and route. And then we can see that this boat actually, um, you know, you can see how the uh, route itself is highlighted, or the active mark is highlighted by the ley lines coming off of it. These ley lines are going to look rather crazy right now because in playback I have noise selected. So effectively the, um, the, 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 the wind input to the system is randomly being, noise has been generated. Now, one of my favorite ribbons in all of Expedition, which I see quite underutilized is a user ribbon where you can select any of the variables or any of the control buttons within any of the, within a lot of Expedition and have them sitting in the user ribbon here. This is a virgin setup on my machine relatively. So I typically have a, um, I like to work my day from left to right. So I will have on the left hand side, the very left hand side of, of my um, screen is I typically have the um, ping the committee boat. So if I go into start, click add to quick access toolbar, we'll see it hasn't popped up. It has popped up to here. I'll go customize that. Um, uh, more commands, I can go and customize that set starboard and I'm going to move that to the top, click OK, and there's my set starboard button. So I pretty much do all of my sailing with this user ribbon open. So I have set starboard, set port, set start time, set the windward lured race course, move marks left, move marks right, for example, all the way along to having an events button on the right hand side over here so that every time we change a sail, for example, I can then go and uh, record it in, in time. Now we have, as you can see, a boat on the screen and a mark. We've got a lot of information. We've talked about charting and now we need to really need to talk about what other information you can directly drag onto the expedition screen. We don't have any data showing at the moment. There are a bunch of windows that, you, there are, that are possible to be shown on screen at any particular time. These, the configuration of these windows, for example, I've got an AIS paint. I'm not sure why that's taking itself way out there. We have a, the ability to take any of these information panes and have them floating, pinned or stacked in any different parts of, of the uh, screen or then just make them go away. Now, any configuration of any of these panes can be saved as a, as, a, as a preset, if you like, what we call a state within the expedition. I will bring up my, one of my, I don't want to say the changes to the old one. I have a display state here of the numbers which I typically like to use 
um, on any given day's racing. I, I, I have mark related numbers and ley line time related numbers and then I have some sort of weather more related numbers and then another page with some other information that I, I may or may not use. And I typically change which numbers are in a lot of these panes not randomly, but quite frequently, just depending on what I'm doing and, and, and how my mindset is working. There is another um, state which um, will automatically get turned on when you set the start time as a pre-start state. This is not my actual formal pre-start state. I'm not sure why it is not saved within the system. I typically do not use this machine for racing on boats. This is my work computer, but I, and I use it for, for other purposes rather than going yacht racing. And we have the ability as well, while we're looking at how the displays can be set up, which have different um, display um, modes, if you like. So there's a lot of information that you can start pulling up onto your screen. Expedition is primarily an information package rather than what you might call a, a, a formal charting package. The, its power is in its numbers and the information it can give you, but it's also very useful for being able to help you um, navigate around parts of the world. So. Those are sort of the basics of the screen and the numbers which are available to you. One thing that I would like to walk, talk a little bit through now is some of the settings within Expedition which every user would have to set up. Everybody has different preferences. If I um, have a look at the system itself, you have the ability to work in local time or UTC time, um, working in magnetic or true, different formats. And what, but one important one that some people miss is tablet mode. Tablet mode when activated means that whenever you have to en enter a variable, it will pop up a touchpad so that you can enter a um, using a touchscreen. Um, you can enter with button presses as opposed to having to bring up a virtual Windows keyboard. Files is an interesting one. As I mentioned earlier, there is a default program data install uh, when you install Expedition for the first time. Now I personally, I like to specify a data folder which is using a cloud backup service so that if I do have any great disasters I can um, access all my information not 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 everything is lost you know I'm, as my example here is, is is I use Dropbox and so all of my data uh, my, my display states for example all of my polls which I've developed everything is all automatically backed up into a Dropbox file Internet is not really of much interest to most people unless you're using GMN's um, optimizers for accessing um, internet um, whilst at sea. Display, there's a lot of functions that you can turn off and on. Some people like more information, some people like less. There are some good graphics um, that are available for you to display on the chart around your boat. Um, so it's worth a step through. Similar to the CMAP or actually the charts for the ENCs, etc. It's it's worth stepping through and just turning off all of the erroneous stuff, which is actually not useful and important. You do have the ability to set alarms based on um, any of the variables within Expedition. So, for example, if you wanted to set a true wind speed uh, maximum alarm, you can go and select true wind speed, set some conditions and the value where this alarm will go off. Expedition does a lot of internal calculating of numbers and you have the ability to, to have, for example, any one of these numbers, number boxes over on the right hand side, you have the ability to set up that they change variables based upon different contexts. You, can, you could have a box, and I might just do a quick demonstration here. Um, I will add alternating zero to my numbers bar here. So I have alternating zero. And if I go back into my alternating numbers, I can have a number alternating between apparent wind angle and apparent wind speed every three seconds. I've got there three seconds. So I click OK and I've got apparent wind speed, apparent wind angle, apparent wind speed, apparent wind angle. There are a bunch of different contexts whether you are sailing upwind, reaching downwind, um, numbers will switch to a pre-start number and either tack or um, you can set a box. If you have a man overboard instance, um, you can set a particular channel to display uh, range and bearing to mark. Um, man overboard, once it is activated, creates an active mark called MOB. Then for example, if you're exporting channels out of Expedition to a mass display that's normally showing target speed, you could have your man overboard button automatically stops that target speed from displaying and it will show alternating range and bearing to the man overboard. 
user section is important to look at. Expedition has the ability to input a number of channels um, and call them different boats. Your default boat is always boat zero. I've still got my um, tablet mode on, click OK, save settings, yes, and then back into there. User, you always want to enable your logging and logging at one second um, and the default logging folder is works perfectly well. You do as well have in here, which I find useful, a, a function that starts other programs at the same, same time that you start Expedition. Now these are the, some of the Expedition's own applications which are useful for Expedition, but you can also add any programs that you like if you want. And, and it's in here that you can also ask Expedition to automatically move the active mark to the next mark as you approach or sail past the bisector. Channels within Expedition is another area which looks a bit daunting, but it's a little bit untouched and I spend a lot of time with people refining this area. Expedition takes a lot of raw data in from instrument systems and sometimes numbers can look very jittery or very jumpy. It is here that you can go in and filter or add a damping to the important variables within Expedition. One very common one is that my, and a lot of we hear very often from people is that my, my ley lines are always jumping around and my ley line time is jumping up and down. Well, this is a function of true wind speed coming into the system can be, can require a little bit of filtering just to settle everything down. Same with true wind direction. So you can actually apply um, you know, five or eight seconds to damping of your true wind direction and that will um, help settle everything down. And you can alter the display precision, which relatively, the defaults are all pretty good, so you don't need to really go in and play around in here unless you've generated some custom numbers. User channels there, this again is a bit of an advanced feature. I will show in a little while sort of how Expedition connects to all the various different instrument systems, but Expedition has some good built-in protocols for connecting to a wide variety of instruments. But there are also some of the more advanced instrument systems have their own channels that can be created within their system. This, we use a, a user channel feature to be able to import those variables outside the, the standard basic ones that everybody needs to import them into Expedition. Race settings is a very important area to, to make sure that you have set up properly for your boat. Um, you can create offsets for your GPS position so that it is offset to the bow for your start protocol, etc. And a lot of it is toggling on or off different features that some people like to use and like. And you know, it's a, it's a good place. It does sort of need to be stepped through and checked that everything is quite right as you like it. What is important within um, the starting package, which it, it's starting to get along to the advanced stage of using Expedition, but there are some very important calibrations that need to be generated for a specific, specific boat because any start system does rely on some form of modeling your boat starting from a very slow speed, how long it needs to know what typically the boat will accelerate at or how quickly a boat will accelerate up to its target speed. And it's also kind of necessary to know what the boat's turning circle is like. There's very little point in um, a system just assuming that once you hit a ley line, you tack exactly on the spot and you're on the ley line. There is a rate of turn which needs to come into the equation because a boat continues to, you know, as you can imagine, with a, with a large radius turning circle, you can well easily end up a long way over the top of any particular ley line. So you can access those calibrations within Expedition um, and there's some, some default examples which can be used, but I would suggest having a good think about your own ones. You can configure how the track is of the boat is displayed. You can have it colorized by some different variables um, and you can have it also to be only drawn for a specific time period behind the boat, which is nice. It cleans up a, a messy display. Weather. This is, as I mentioned earlier, a big topic. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment once we get beyond this basic setups. As is tides, there are a bunch of different tidal models, which have some are freely available and some are subscription based. And it's worth having a look around at what's available and what you might require. I will show a little bit, a bit of tides a little bit further on. And at the bottom, there are a bunch of configurations for optimal routing. Um, there's two panels here. It's not a subject that we need to get into right now, but it is something which I will be covering in some future sessions. So um, one important thing that we haven't 
looked at. We've sort of looked at our display setup and, and numbers and typically what expedition looks like is actually a very important part of it is connecting two instruments. In our drop down window up here, we click on our instruments button and expedition will automatically go through and detect COM ports which are available on your system. These are all redundant ports from the last time I connected to a uh, to a, uh, a multiplexer of some description and I just haven't gone and removed them. So if you have a hardware serial port or a virtual serial port created by a, a USB serial converter, um, you will get COM ports pop up. A nice little feature is that you can give a description to each one of these ports so that you know what it is once you have connected to it. And as you can see in instruments, there is a whole host of options um, from a basic NMEA 0183 old serial data output and expedition typically populates the default values, um, but you may need to have a little look at what your values are to make sure that the communications are working properly. And you will, but there are some troubleshooting tools which are context specific down in settings. For example, you know, this is an EMA 0183 settings, whereas if I had connected to a, a BNG H390, for example, of click apply, I'm going to get a different set of um, settings within that dialog. I will click up here to none. A, a powerful part within the instrument connectivity of Expedition is we can connect over the network, any local networks, to network um, enabled instrument systems or other computers running Expedition. I have Expedition instruments selected here because if I have uh, two installs of Expedition on the same network, I can within um, this dialog on this machine control what variables I am sending out over UDP. I'm just going to click Expedition here and as you see here I have a completely different dialog altogether and I can control my transmit filter of what I am sending from this install of Expedition out to another install and also control what's coming back. It's a bit of an advanced use but it is a very useful part of um, connecting expedition Ex especially actually more commonly today with um you know h5000 um and they networked their a lot of their systems together so there is a network connection we have it populated um as a web socket and we have our i've clicked apply okay no um and so now we have uh, bng controls etc it, and it has populated with the default IP address and the default port that is required. Okay, so that's really um, the instrument connectivity. You do have the ability within Expedition, it can itself be an integrated instrument system with just raw input. It's just worth pointing out now because I, I do get a few instances where I have, especially with uh, some uh, Ray Marine systems that don't output uh, true and speed and true and direction for some reason or true and angle. Expedition can take the uh, apparents which are coming in and your boat speeds and actually calculate it internally. So um, you can select what variables you'd actually like Expedition to calculate for you. I will deselect these. So you go and select which ones you want Expedition to make your calculations for you and then you have the ability to go and apply calibrations to all of those so if you want expedition to if you want to calibrate the boat speed and advance calibrate the boat speed which has been fed to expedition you can recalibrate it for expedition's purposes in here and actually you can then rebroadcast it out and have it displayed on some instrument systems it's quite flexible you have the ability to generate quite large tables if you wish to create your own numbers into your own internal calibrations within Expedition. Expedition requires polos in a, in a, in a particular format. It is a, um, it's a text-based file. Um, they're relatively freely available, most polos for most boats, but there are easy conversion tools out there to convert non-Expedition-based polos into an Expedition format. Expedition comes pre-installed with a wide variety of of polars. If I click on load here, we can see I've got some of my own ones interspersed with um, all of the standard ones which come installed. We, 
we have no guarantees of how accurate they are for um, for any of these particular boats, but um, they're a good baseline to start with. Expedition has um, a variety of different polars or polar tabs available to you. The nav polar is primarily used in nav for navigation purposes, and that is for determining ley lines. It is for it is used in your optimal routing, and it so it's very much a polar which should reflect your ability what you're what you actually are physically able to sail to as opposed to the performance polar now a lot of boats and i do it myself as well is maintain both polars are identical but the idea of the performance polar is that this offers the performance polar offers the numbers up to your target speeds and angles and your polar percentages or polar speeds when you're reaching now the the ultimate difference really is is it say for any given day if you find yourself unable to achieve your target speeds by five percent or something like that you would for navigation purposes you would lock, you would want to retard your speed a little bit so that your your times and your ley lines for example are all reflecting reality whereas you would not want to go and adjust your targets because they are the best ability they, they are the best that the boat can sail at um, so there is a there is a, 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 a you know a very important but subtle difference between the two. The start polar is the polar which is used within the expedition to calculate uh, start times to ends of line, etc. There's a couple of different schools of thought. Some people um, do like to retard this polar um, a certain amount, considering uh, not necessarily going to be sailing at 100% of your target speeds when you're you know when you're accelerating up to those speeds during a start system some people like to retard them five percent i've seen them retarded as much as 80 percent my personal um perspective is with the boats that i race on as i leave them at 100 percent or just under expedition has a heel polar facility so that you can actually create a um a set of target heel angles for given wind speeds and wind angles there is a default one with well, a, an example one with an expedition which i don't think is fantastic but it is a good baseline or demonstration it's an old far 40 heel polar it looks a bit funky but that's just a function of it working on true wind speeds and wind speeds and wind angles and you have an expedition number which is available to you for example is a a heel we have heel and we've got i've got a i don't have target heel up on this one but it heel and target heel are quite a commonly used um, variable these days. Now, you also have the ability to create any of your own polars for any of your other variables. If you want to have a, a target force day load, for example, or a target leeway angle, you can go and, for example, there is, at, well, for any of these variables, you can have targets for um, deflector loads, for example, based on a true wind speed and a true wind angle. We can load a leeway one from far 40 leeway is an example open and then i just need to go and assign what variable that target number is relating to and uh, <coughs> leeway so now this becomes defined as a leeway polar so i can now i've got my leeway variables here i could have a target leeway next to that variable and that's for you know very advanced use but they're there for people who, who who are fanatic about their numbers now to moving along sail charts another very important thing to have loaded in the expedition it is a very useful thing some people don't find it useful i personally do and oh, my numbers are going to get rid of these there are some defaults within the expedition and we can use both an expedition um, uh, grid-based format, which is a which is a it's again it's a text-based file, or the KND XML-based files. Now, these are used in two ways. These sail crossover charts. When you run a route optimization, you you will have the ability to output what sails would be up during that route optimization on each step of the route. Inshore racing. It, you can actually have a number box output um, number boxes. This has gone all the way over here. Okay, I'm going to pin that to the side. 
you can actually, well, if I have in my routing window, my route down the bottom here, I will have an output of which sail up that I should have for any particular leg of the course. Um, you can see A4 has pointed up down here. Now with my random numbers flying around in my, in my charting screen here, this is going to change around. Um, you can see J3 Reef 1. And actually, if you pay attention, I might just turn the noise off for a second and uh, turn the noise off and we'll fix on those numbers. I actually have three dots on my sail crossover chart. I have one dot here, which is the, for the speed and angle that I am sailing at right now. The M, a dot with a little M in it, I'm not sure how clear it is to see for you guys. That M means if I point at the mark and sail at the mark right now, and N is for next leg. So this is the sail shot I have for the next leg. So as we can see here, the leg I'm on at the moment from the boat to mark number 152, I'm using sail J1, which you know copies right here, and the following leg is A1. Now, the sail chart can be edited and manipulated within uh, Expedition. This is a, a reef um, curve, for example, here. And then you can save them out and develop your sail charts over time. You can add new sails. And a nice thing with the XML-based format, the K&D-based format for sail crossover charts, is it does show you crossovers. There are you know, different thoughts on how a sail crossover should, chart should work if these crossovers, for example, here between an A1 and an A2 should exist, or they should be much more fine line points where you, know, you either have the right sail up or the wrong sail, not just, I'm not sure if it should be one or the other. So that is a sail crossover chart. Developing these is a long conversation, so it's not something I'm going to go into now, but there is uh, a couple of um, formats available and, and test ones available for uh, at, uh, when you install Expedition. The next subject I was going to cover quickly, which is an interesting one for everybody, and I'm going to turn off my uh, simulation now because that's driving me a little bit nuts, is weather. Weather is a very interesting subject. I'm just going to go back into my control here and I will leave my um, world chart view on here. Within Expedition a lot of the freely based weather sources are available. For example sail docs which will allow us to access the GFS weather models. Um, most people are probably familiar with sail docs and it's quite easy to select sail docs, click and drag across the screen and select what variables or what models I want to download. I'm going to leave it at GFS, but there is also the drop downs, which is available from the service for ocean currents, uh, um, the high resolution uh, information from the US and some other models. So let's just, I'll leave it on GFS and we can select what variables that we want to download uh, with this current file download, how many days. Expedition does a nice, why it uh, does a nice job of, of setting up default timestamps to try and keep our file size uh, a little bit minimized in that from the first timestamp it will download every three hours uh, a timestamp for every three hours out to 24 hours and then it will step out to well no it actually steps out to 36 42 and then it will go um, it will step out to six hours, 12 hours, and then almost 24, I uh, know 12 hours, out. because there's little point in having very high resolution timestamp data, um, you know, three or four days out in a forecast. If I just select grip file, and if I have an interconnect connection, we can monitor it, it's going to self um, download and display itself uh, directly on the screen. That was quite a big file that I've chosen there. Um, so hopefully everyone can still hear or see me while I am doing this. So, oh, that doesn't look good. I'll just change that. So we've downloaded a weather file from GFS and it is instantly displayed on screen. These controls will help us to have a look at what information is available to us. Tooltip, for example, I click on tooltip and it will tell us at any particular point where I drop my mouse, any information at that position on planet Earth at that time, what the grid file has contained within it. Sometimes it is nice to be able to toggle on and off the weather just to keep a screen nice and clean. Now, a very useful feature of Expedition is in your ability to have dis different display states and how you represent the weather. I think that I am close with this one to a default display setup. Now, if I click in settings, and it will bring me directly to the weather window. The different, 
I can define each of the different variables within the grid file and change how they are displayed. For example, in my 10 meter winds, which were contained in the grid file, instead of showing barbs, I want to show um, streamlines for a different graphical representation. If I click OK, my wind barbs have been turned into streamlines. Now I need to go back and toggle that off. And barbs. But I may want to toggle between wind barbs and streamlines. So if I go to uh, display setting number two for weather, it's going to represent the weather in a completely different way. Now an extension of this is I can actually then highlight other features within the weather. Rain, for example. And sillyly enough, I did not download rain with that GFS file. So it's actually a good example to show here. If I go back into weather data, I'll go back into sail docs. I'll click and zoom over the same area. I do not want to get mean sea level pressure and wind because I already have it. I want to get a group file with rain for all of the other same parameters, get the group file. It's just such a small file and there is my rain. Now, if I go into settings, I can see that I have two grid files. One was the original one we downloaded and then one that contains the rain. They, the names are pretty much exactly the same, but the, what Expedition will do with any grid files which are loaded into the system, it will display any data that is available at the timestamp that we have the screen time set at. So now I can see rain. It's not, I need to refine how that rain is, is, is shown a little bit. We also have, for example, we downloaded waves when I downloaded that original file. So this is a graphic representation of, if I show my tooltip, um, of the significant wave height in this particular area at 3.6 meters. And I've got the ability to go and change the, the contouring of, of how that's represented. Let's see what, I don't think I have anything on five and six. So I go back to one, I have some representation of wind on my screen. Now I can, step forward in time or set my time, my display time. So if I just step to now, this is the time that we have right now. We've got some buttons to control stepping it through through the wind with the grid file timestamps, which would be every three hours. If you notice on the top left hand side of my screen here, it's showing the timestamp that we are displaying at this particular point in time. So we're stepping forward every three hours. Whereas we also have the ability to step forward every predefined time an animation interval here in time of 15 seconds okay so we have the ability to also play it and we can sit back and watch where the systems evolve and move around on our screen just stepping back a little bit to the weather settings um, is very important for everybody to remember is that your grid files are downloaded at 10 meter well they reference surface wind which is generally at 10 meters now, all of our yachts have, or the vast majority of our yachts have um, wind sensors which are a lot higher off the water than that on average. So you need to scale up the winds from 10 meters up to the level that your wind, speed, your wind sensor is at. Um, and this is where, this is a very large boat. Where I'm, I'm currently doing a little bit of assistance routing them across the Atlantic. This is a 60 odd meter rig and I've had to increase the wind speeds from 10 meters by 18 percent to get them to equate to what the wind sensor would be reading that far off the water. There is in Expedition in the help file actually a little um, formula which will help you to calculate where that where you should set your 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 wind scale off to. Um, I've Personally, haven't seen any boats yet with a, a mast shorter or running expedition with a, with, a, with a shorter mast, but the, the, I guess the principle is the same, that you need to drop your, 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 your 10 meter winds down a level. I hope that answers the question from Mark there. The same thing goes actually for polars. It is very important to remember that if you get a polar from a designer, for example, is that, is to ask the question, are those polars generated with a 10 meter wind or are they generated with a masthead wind? And they would use a very similar formula to calculate the difference in the wind speed between masthead and 10 meters. Currents is also a very important feature within Expedition. So I'm going to go and just turn off the showing of that weather so that it doesn't confuse things. As there's a reasonably 
nice tied module within Expedition. Some are free and some are paid. You know, we do need to subscribe, for example, to Winning Tides and there are um, the um, Proudman model areas, for example, which have a reasonable amount of tidal information. But I've got my Winning Tides and a European model here. If I just go and turn on my tidal stations, it's just to demonstrate and show to you some of the, the models available. Expedition does a nice job of, of drawing currents in, in various ways. You can, in the same way that you turn on CMAP, so this looks a bit more realistic, and turn off my raster chart, so that you can see the behavior of tides over time. And if I'm back on weather and I click play, we can see the, the ebb and flow. This is looking at winning tides for the Solent. We can look at the ebb and flow of tidal currents in and out of here. For those who are in the US, for example, we can have a look at Long Island. Um, these are built-in models um, installed with Expedition. They're freely available, no data. So we have a very similar interaction over here. Um, did I click the Chesapeake or Long Island? I can't remember. Um, so we've got, you know, we've got Long Island information flowing in and out of here like this. You can offset. I mean, no tidal model is perfect. You can, within the tidal system, offset the streams in time and by scale. Um, so quite often, even with um, sailing with winning tides in the Solent and everything is, you know, it's very closely monitored. It is not uncommon for me to adjust my uh, my streams, my time, my stream times by maybe 30 minutes or an hour. And also on a percentage basis, depending on um, how, you know, in neaps and springs or a prevailing wind by sometimes up to 20%. I adjust my stream. So we do have to have a look around and observe what is happening before you start really pending on your tidal information, especially when it becomes critical in ley lines. For example, in ley lines, you, you, you suggest that um, uh, it's in display, I believe, um, where you're using ley lines with predicted tides. So in all, quite, quite a lot of information and quite powerful information. And it, I've tried to condense this introduction across what Expedition can really do. The how do I do is a very long topic, which I was going to get into in the very near future for those who are interested in doing some of these smaller sessions to become better at using the tools within Expedition. We, we skipped over the start feature, which I do apologize for. If I go back to my boat, which has disappeared from the screen because there is no boat input. So if I go back to playback and simulate again, and I'm going to, I'm just going to give it a yeah, true and speed of say 15 knots and a true and direction I've got there like this. So I'm going to artificially set up a port end of the line and a starboard end of the line. And this is something which will be done or can be done. I'm going to unlock those marks because they were automatically locked, unlock the port, and bring them in here. Now if I go into start and if I click on my uh, start box, this will bring up the start display. Now with the start display running, I have my boat, it is in playback, um, no set and drift, doing polar speed. Okay, so I can drag these marks down to make this a little more realistic. I've set myself a fairly square line. You get some information which pops up straight away, um, which is what the what wind direction the line is square to. The bias across the line is one degree at the moment to port, so that's a tenth of a nautical mile. The, <laughs> my start line's eight nautical miles long, which is probably a little excessive. Just down here. So now we start to get and see some sensible numbers. Still an nautical mile long. Okay, and now we get the grid pop up, which is good. And we've got the boat sailing across the screen. So I have what we're seeing here without a, I'm going to set a start timer, timer five minutes to the gun, go. So in this example, 
we've got some very powerful information coming directly at us. We have a boat length grid, so we can actually visually see if we are sailing across parallel to the start line, how far we are away from a particular ley line. For example, here, the starboard ley line to the pen end of the line. If I move this down a little further, the numbers, other numbers which are showing us based on the speeds that we're doing at the moment is we've got three minutes and 24 seconds to burn or three minutes, 23 seconds to burn if we turned up and sailed straight at the start line from where we are. Um, if we wanted to sail directly to the port end of the line, we've still got three minutes and four seconds to burn. If we tacked and sailed directly at the starboard end of the line, we've still got two minutes, 15 to burn. So this is very powerful and it can be very powerful if it's well used and very refined. Um, we have some tools to assist with the starting package. Typically in a starting sequence when the boats are doing circles and there is a lot of other boats around, it is very difficult to calculate accurately current and also your true wind speed and true wind direction can become quite unreliable. So we do have a feature to be able to hold the wind speed and direction. We can feed it directly from the instruments and hold the wind speed and direction and um, say even if we're in an area for example, in the med that has zero current, you will start registering current, doing tight circles and you know leeway going up and down and all sorts of things. So you can go hold drift and, and, and set it to hold. So now we have the ability, as we see a true and direction shift, we can actually go and add manually to our true and direction or manually add it back the other way. So it's overriding the instrument feed. But if we want to turn it off, we just simply go and uncheck these boxes. And also we can have that set in our settings to automatically turn those off once the start gun has gone off. So uh, that kind of brings me to the end of what I wanted to demonstrate. I have one question here.